timber has to answer the people with bleed. That's right. They made a promise when they bought these places for low and middle income earners that they were going to, uh, going to do the place up. Because they were squatted when we came in, an agreement was entered into. You said you haven't paid rent since you've been there, like, you know, that's a colour of people's opinion. Your management referred to the, to the project office to bring it back to the next meeting, right? Is that right? Among its audiovisual collections, the National Archives of Australia holds black and white half inch video from the 1970s documenting residents' meetings at a time when the Department of Urban and Regional Development, under Tom Uren, invited consultation on urban renewal. It was a time when portable video, the Porter Pack, and media activism inspired by the Canadian Challenge for Change program was an instrument of participatory democracy. Back in those days, I remember we were talking about how important it was to um, put um, the media in the hands of the people. You know, how do you empower disenfranchised, disadvantaged communities? And, uh, you know, how do you use video to kind of communicate between those communities and, and opinion and decision makers? Give them cameras. <laughs> Sydney was an accidental city. It spread like wildfire through unregulated development from the earliest occupation of the Aboriginal lands of the Cadigal clans. From the 1920s, those who could afford it moved to the city's perimeters, leaving the terrace houses of the inner city to the underprivileged. A plan in 1948 promised a series of freeways radiating out of the central business district so that city workers could drive to and from the city from their idealised existence in the suburbs. 40,000 dwellings were considered dispensable as slums in Woolloomooloo, Surrey Hills, Paddington, Piermont and Balmain. And included in the demolition plans were large sections of inner city glebe. There was no consideration for the inner city residents Department of Main Roads uh, purchased hundreds of houses in the path of each of these different distributors and they were systematically demolishing them. The Glebe Estate was a remnant of a colonial land grant to the Anglican Diocese of Sydney and by the early 1970s the Sydney Anglican Church still owned two large estates in Glebe, Bishopsall and St Philip's Estates which included 19 hectares of prime real estate containing 700 houses. And the church decided to sell the estates. And of course, it was in a rather rundown state because the Church of England had spent hardly anything on it for many years. And their expectation was that it could all, it would all disappear. Uh, the proposals for Glee were would have resulted in the, the dem demolition of about a, a thousand houses. So that's me there, <laughs> painting the title of the film, Fixed Street <laughs> Fiasco, on a wall <laughs> of one of the buildings that was going to be demolished. I'd been to a few public meetings about the expressway and the opposition to it. And there was the opposition to it was partly driven by the Glebe Society, partly <laughs> driven by the squatter group. I thought, well, what I'd really like to do is put something together to show at a residence meeting, a large one which had been called at the town hall. It stirred up a, a very passionate debate. And I guess one of the things that I realised, the process was actually more important than the product. <laughs> I think of unions such as the BLF, the Amalgamated Metal Workers Union and the FEDNFA hadn't put bands on the rocks, then the rocks would certainly have been into the ground, as would Woolloomer Blue, yeah. as would Surrey Hills and as would Glebe today. This expressway would be going on. So many of the things now we seem to take for granted were regarded as quite odd years ago. <laughs> and, um, you know, the whole idea of preserving historic districts, that really had to be fought for. 
So, of course, the saviour came when um, the Labour government was elected. In December 1972, the Whitlam government came to power and established the Department of Urban and Regional Development under Tom Uren. The Commonwealth bought the Glebe estate from the Church of England for $17.5 million. The Glebe project offered Federal Minister Tom Uren an opportunity to stymie the planned inner city expressway scheme and to advance the government's policy of maintaining inner city housing for low income residents. By August 1974, Uren's department had acquired the Glebe estate. <laughs> the Glebe project appointed David Young as project manager and Nita McRae as community development officer. The resident being annoyed will call the police out and then there will be retaliation. A residence advisory committee was convened. Right-wing Labor Party operatives gained control of the committee under the chairmanship of Tom Whitty and Vice Chair Vince Nash. I have a complete answer to that. I've, uh, at first, I've uh, heard a rumour about this. I've taken steps to issue a writ. I just want to ask two questions. One, who does employ They were social conservatives. They supported restoration of the houses on the estate, but resented squatters whose activism had helped prevent the demolition plans. It was actually the squatting which sort of allowed these services to be established. You know, it was very freeing. Not paying rent, I think, is really uh, adds significantly to what you can do you know, with your life. So how long have you been there? Uh, I think quite enough to two years. She have not paid me anything. You haven't got a rental receipt of any description. Well, it wasn't accepted. Well, there you are, a good seat. Squatters, at, uh, we were suspicious of the state or you know, bureaucratic in interference in our lives, and so we didn't involve ourselves with the consultative process on the Glebe estate. Just Chairman, I'm one of the people from Elsie, and I'd like to say that we didn't particularly want to come, but we were asked to come, and I'd like through you to ask the Community Development Officer to, to explain to me what I'm doing here. Well, I'm sorry. I, I didn't invite you. Well, you didn't invite you. Uh, look, I, I invited him. Oh, well, uh, no, we invited him. Right. Uh, <laughs> the reason is uh, there's been a fair amount of, of criticism of Elsie. Yeah. I thought the, the best way to sort of get over one of this would be for Elsie to come along. Elsie was the name of a vacant house occupied by feminist squatters in March 1974 as a women's refuge from domestic violence. Now, now you, 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 you look after Elsie, are you the woman no, in charge? No, there's nobody in charge. But isn't the federal government paying someone up there to be in charge? No, they're paying seven employed people. Yeah, well, who are they? Yeah. That's us. Well, you are getting paid. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's what no, no, you asked who was in charge, and I said there's nobody in charge. Yeah, but someone's getting, the seven years are getting paid. There are paid counsellors working at us. Well, I've had reports from the school about lesbianism going on in houses. These little children came over to me. They said, well, we see two girls kissing one girl on top of the other. I was really shocked. Now, so that thing's just going on else, it's, that's not what it's really meant for. If you want to cast any expression about anything in the refuge, you can say it to me. Because I was one of the women that started the Elsie refuge. Free ourselves! Free our sisters! Free ourselves! The women's movement sort of exploded by the late 60s, early 70s. And women were demanding acknowledgement of the uh, oppression of women in our society. And instead of waiting around for, um, you know, for the government or authority to actually do something about it, people just went out and did it, you know, direct action. When residents are going to have their terraces changed, they want to see the designs that we do. And it's good to get them right down here to, to a meeting, get their comments, and get it all down on video so we can then listen. So that's why, you know, they are so fascinating, those videos, to actually see see people and to really understand the, the context. The community must be allowed to come in and sort of not feel, you know, that there's anything going on behind closed doors. That, that you know, they were obviously painstakingly explaining to all the local residents about what they intended to do and in order to get their support. We're also, of course, fighting 
the whole idea of the way town planning worked in um, New South Wales. I don't think they knew what they were doing. <laughs> I think I had no idea what they were doing with that medium. You couldn't just simply film a group, you know, you had to kind of put this to some use. Even if it's a question of cutting down what they'd said, showing it to the same group, you know, so they could see like a mirror of themselves. I only one question the girl about is, you've got to run up there for the runaway mothers, but what about the runaway fathers? Can't you get something going for us? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important for radical or unofficial histories to be written, and uh, who better to write that history than a participant? And what we want is a situation that endures whether Labor's in power or whether the Liberal Country Party's in power. Now, believe me, the only way you can cause that to happen is if we find a way to make this thing work financially as well as socially. This is a working class district, and I don't think the people in this district can afford the pay the rents that's been suggested. If you move these people out, we'll get more money for the people in the Country Party. Well, we can the Prime Minister, Mr Whitlam, has been sacked by the Governor-General. The proclamation was countersigned Malcolm Fraser. When the Labour government fell and a Conservative government under Malcolm Fraser was elected in December 1975, Uren's department was devolved into two other departments, resulting in cuts to the Glebe project funding. Rents were increased to market levels. And then eventually they sold it to the State Housing Commission in 1985. But the majority of it is, is intact. Glebe Estate residents waited for 10 years for the promised rehabilitation of the estate. Today, Glebe is another country. Residents continue to resist high-rise development. Glebe居民张贴了一些标语来表达对社区的热爱。最大的公民行动组织格利布协会也为此做出了积极的努力。他们与政客以及城市规划人员交谈，撰写文章，开展社交媒体活动，来提高公众的认识。